I've heard it said that March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. If that is in fact true, then the lion is quite well today for any of you who have been outside on this day in March. So as you look around the table here, I don't know if this is really apparent to you, but what it is is a very small model of the Eiffel Tower. Then you come across here to my chain, my trusty chain. Because I also hear that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. What do the Eiffel Tower and the chain, and believe it or not, you and I have in common? Well, it's really what lies beneath. What lies beneath. Here's what I mean by that. You build a house. House looks great. What you don't see is the foundation. The Eiffel Tower. Absolutely beautiful structure. Has stood the test of time in Paris. But what you don't see is what's underneath. Our character, whether we look at the traits individually or collectively, are that foundation. You can't physically see each one of the traits. What you see is the outcome, the consequence of those individual traits as a collection in each one of us. Take the foundation under a home and not excavate properly. You weaken the foundation. That's how sometimes you end up with cracks in the walls. Leaning Tower of Pizza, <laughs> sorry, I do like Lido's, Pisa, also wasn't built on real firm ground. And as you can see, the tower has a tendency to lean. Weak links. Strong chains, strong character, no weak links. Easy to say because we're, we're people, we're human, we make mistakes, and that's okay. But the wise person learns from those mistakes the first time and doesn't repeat them. Kind of like the boy who cried wolf, didn't really learn until it was much too late. You ever hear of a pachyderm? Pachyderm? It's the elephant. And of course, the elephant is the symbol for the trait, the character trait of responsibility. Because that elephants just don't forget. So you look at what some of the characteristics of a person who is responsible are. Person who does their very, very best, is self-disciplined exercises self-control, good judgment. And boy, here is a word that we hear often, but sometimes have a very, very hard time responding to, accountability, which basically means, I didn't do it. But if you did, well, then just be honest. I, I did it. Do you have any idea? what benefits can be reaped from just being accountable. And here's what I mean by that. Over the years, I had an opportunity to write many letters of recommendation. Some of you are at that point now where you're thinking, well, am I going to go to one of the service academies? Is, am I going to go to a trade school? Am I going to go to a junior college, four-year college? I'm applying for a scholarship. I'm applying for a grant and aid, whatever the case may be. Or maybe it's a leadership. Maybe, maybe the Hugh O'Brien Foundation, maybe the uh, American Legion, where they have youth leadership for men and young women. My point is, those don't come easily. And each one of those generally comes with a packet in which someone, a teacher, a coach, 
a guidance counselor, someone who knows you well is asked to evaluate your character. And in those packets and in those questions, generally there is at least one and sometimes there are several questions pertaining to your character. You need to be well aware of those things because what you do, what you say, how you act, how you treat others basically goes to show just how responsible you are. So, the Eiffel Tower, the chain. I'm sure everybody recognizes Play-Doh. You open it up and inside there's a putty clay-like substance. Depending on your colors, you have all sorts of different colors. Many different colors. But the substance is the same. And I'm sure most of you, because I know I did, I tried to eat it. And it doesn't matter whether it's white or blue or red or pink or purple. They all taste the same. A lot of different colors. But the substance, the substance is the same. Kind of like people. Kind of like people. Lots of different colors but the substance is the same. Sports, back in season. Newton's third law of motion. It works really well in science. If you ever take a look at a really slow motion photograph of a soccer ball being kicked, it actually, momentarily, it, it, it kind of, how should we say, implodes a little bit, and then all of a sudden, it takes off. Same thing with the baseball, golf ball. They are momentarily impacted. When you run, you push, and then you go forward. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That works great when it comes to laws of motion. People are not quite the same because there's a variable in people called emotions. Emotions. And this is where self-control, judgment, discipline come into play. So I'm going to give you a for instance here. I hope, I hope you never are called into court for slandering another person's good name. That's spoken. Libel, you're, you're talking about people. Maybe I have those reversed, but it doesn't matter the order they come in. The bottom line is you have either written something or said something or both about another person, and usually it's hearsay. It's hearsay. And the bottom line is, you can pay a very heavy price for that. You don't go around talking about people. You really shouldn't talk about them anyway. If you have anything to say, you should go to the person directly. So I want you to think carefully about this story that has some pretty direct implications if you're ever exposed to people who are talking about, speaking about, saying things about people that can be harmful to their character and their reputation. So, there are two neighbors, teenagers, and the one teenager starts talking to some other people in the neighborhood about one of his fellow neighbors and says, I hear that that guy is a thief. I hear. And so, once it is spoken, there's something called a fait accompli. Once it's spoken, it's out there. It's kind of like using the analogy of, all right, there's that target over there, and the target has a good backdrop, so I'm going to take my pellet gun because I have a good backdrop. I don't want that pellet going anywhere else other than to the target and into the backdrop. That's part of being responsible. And so, boom, I shoot. Man, I wish I could get that pellet back, because I really missed. 
I'm an awful shot. Well, yeah, I might be an awful shot. And I was wide of the target. It hit the backdrop. No harm, no foul. But my point is, once that thing's left the barrel, once I pulled the trigger, that's it. There is no calling it back. So my point is, the word, get, get, word gets back to the young man that that guy across the street says you're a thief. So the young man goes over to that fellow and said, Where, where'd you hear that? Well, I really can't say. Because it might have been third or fourth hand. But the point of the matter, I really can't. Well, I don't really like what you had to say about me. And so... The parents confer, and the father of the boy who made that libelous or slanderous statement says, you know, son, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take exactly what you wrote about that young man, write it on a piece of paper. Later this evening, I want you to tear it up into tiny, tiny pieces, and then go out into the yard and scatter those pieces in the backyard. In the morning, I want you to go out and I want you to collect all those pieces. Try to put them, sorry, try to put them back together. Son does what dad asks. But what the son finds out is that morning he can't find all the pieces. He can't undo what he had done. I think, think the moral of the story is pretty clear. Yes, that young man may never have said, I'm sorry, may never have stolen anything. But the bottom line is, once it's out there, now you have introduced into the public forum the possibility that that person may be a thief when they never, ever engaged in thievery in the first place. What a pity. What a pity to take somebody's good name and reputation based on hearsay and drag it through the mud. Don't ever do that. Please. So as we move ahead, Newton's laws work real well in science. But when you say something that seems to have so little consequence, all of a sudden, whew, there's a reaction to that action that's far out of proportion than the person ever thought it would be. Keep those things in mind. You know, it's a good idea to read. Readers are leaders. And if you take a look at something like a local newspaper, the Bay Times and the Record Observer, you start looking through there and you find out that, oh, by the way, on April 10th, May 15th and June 19th, there are beach cleanups across the bayfront. That's acting responsibly as far as the environment is concerned. Then you turn a page, give me a second here, and you find out that there is actually a foundation that is offering free screenings for persons with developmental disabilities, a foundation offering free screenings for persons with developmental disabilities. My point is, whether it's individuals cleaning up the beach or individuals acting in a responsible manner to try to take care of their fellow citizens, that's responsible behavior. You think to yourself, what are some of the little things you can do that really will make a difference? Gentle reminders. You know, there's such a thing as constructive criticism and destructive criticism. For instance, you're driving down the road, you're a passenger in a vehicle, and you just happen to notice that a person's seatbelt is unfastened. Or, somewhat worse, a person is driving and texting or driving and talking or driving and texting and talking at the same time. Now, there are various ways to address that. Hopefully, as a passenger in that car, you would think about the safety, yours, 
as well as the safety of the other individuals in the vehicle and just say, you know, very gently, it doesn't have to be with any kind of force, but just say, hey, may, you might want to buckle that seatbelt. It could save your life. Or, hey, maybe that call, maybe that text is not nearly as important as keeping your eyes on the road. Now, the manner in which you would say that is going to have a direct impact on how that person responds. You could be riding bikes along the trail and seeing a friend of yours going lickety-split, getting very, very close to an intersection. Now, maybe they're not aware that they're getting close to an intersection because they're just enjoying the weather, but just say, hey, 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 look, look down the road a bit. There's an intersection out there. There are a lot of them. Gentle persuasion goes a long, long way. I think it's Women's History Month. And one of the things that I'd really like to try to cover with you today is some women who have, how should we say, forged trails. They're called trailblazers. Some of them have not only overcome gender barriers, but racial barriers as well. Some of them were born right here in the state of Maryland. So, with that said, I am going to read them from my notes because I don't want to skip a beat on this. So, the first ones I'm going to mention to you. If you watched the Super Bowl this year, if memory serves me correctly, T Tampa Bay did defeat the Chiefs. Now, whether you noticed the sidelines or not, most people don't really look at sidelines, but there was a coach... Javada Farr there, Coach Javada Farr, and another coach, Coach Locust, Javada Farr and Locust. Both of them are women. Coach Javada Farr is the strength and conditioning coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Must know what she's doing, huh? Coach Locust, defensive line assistant coach. Anybody who's ever played the D-line on football knows it is no joke. <laughs> so, my point of the matter to you is two women, first time, two females who happen to be African American as well, coached a professional football team during the Super Bowl. And oh, by the way, Tampa Bay won. From there, how about Amy Trask? In 1997, she was the first woman appointed as a general manager of a professional football team. First woman, 1997, Oakland Raiders. How about Kim Ng? Just recently, the first woman to be appointed the general manager of a professional baseball team, Miami Marlins. And you know who the only call this gentleman made? Derek Jeter. If you know anything about professional baseball, he's a legend. And the bottom line is, he said, I didn't think of calling anybody else except her. First woman general manager of a professional baseball team. As we move ahead, what about Wilma Rudolph? All righty. Polio. See, most of you are so, so young, you, you don't know what polio is. I remember polio. I remember polio very well. It crippled some of the young men that I grew up with. One of the families I grew up with, their mother had it as a child, and it forever affected her ability to walk. What's my point? Polio alone is enough to stop an individual from becoming a world-class athlete. Oh, well, couple of that with scarlet fever. A scarlet fever can seriously damage the heart. Oh, but, geez. Number three, how about pneumonia? Have any idea what pneumonia can do to your lungs? So here you have Wimbledon Rudolph. Pneumonia? Polio, scarlet fever. Doctors thought she'd never walk again. Well, I got news for you. Now, I was right around seventh or eighth grade when she was running. No, even younger, because her first Olympics was 1956. My point is, in the 1956 Olympics, in the four by one relay, which is four people running 100 yards, her team took bronze. Fast forward to the 1960 Olympics in Melbourne, Australia. 
that woman took home, took home gold in three events as well as setting world records. So the Open 100, the Open 200, and the 4x1 relay, gold medals. The doctor said she'd never walk again. What's my point? When you look at people like these women, believe me, they exemplify the best. They exemplify what is best in character. The chain, very strong links in their chains of character. Let's move to Althea Gibson. Althea Gibson, now you may, if you like baseball, you'll know the name Jackie Robinson. Broke color barriers in baseball. Well, Althea Gibson broke color barriers in tennis. African-American woman who won Wimbledon, not only Wimbledon, but she also won the U.S. Open. Great book about her called I Always Wanted to Be Somebody. Let's come home now. Let's come home now. 17 years ago, a young lady by the name of Brenda Fries was appointed head women's basketball coach at the University of Maryland. This weekend, they just won another Big Ten championship. What's unique about her? First of all, she's very humble. But she achieved her 500th win this year. 17 goes into 500, just shy of 30, which means on the average, her teams have won 30 games a year during the regular season and postseason. Brenda Fries, very, very humble individual, so terribly successful as a coach. What about Alexandra Miller? Anybody that knows anything about the Navy, a yeoman, third class, she takes the helm. Do you know what she takes the helm on? The USS Teddy Roosevelt, it is a carrier. It is 1,072 feet long. It is 234 feet wide. It weighs over 117,000 tons. Can you imagine standing at the helm and steering and operating and navigating that ship? And that's another local girl. So we have women who are either part of the current history, past history, or are making history today. Three Mailanders. You might not recognize the name Eleonora Fagan, born right up in Baltimore, but some of you would recognize the name of Billie Holiday, born Eleonora Fagan, right in Baltimore. How about Rachel Carson? If any of you are interested in the environment and environmental science, she began the whole national, how should we say, look at and study of environmental issues. Landmark book about 1960 called Silent Spring. And of course, finally, Grandma Moses with a museum in her honor and the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman, if you haven't been to the museum down in Cambridge, it's well worth the trip. Well worth the trip. So I hope in some way, shape, or form today, I want you to understand if you carry nothing else from today, Understand something about responsibility. If you're responsible, you are accountable. Notice the equal signs. There's a reason for that. If you make good decisions, that's because of good judgment. The outcomes, if you are responsible, accountable, and use good judgment, are your consequences. And those consequences are going to pay dividends for you pay dividends for you in your life. Let your life, let your character be the foundation upon which you build your future. You'll be richer and better for it. So thank you again very, very much. It's been a pleasure bringing this lesson to you today.